very strong name. Ben Krug, my boy. When he told me his name, I was like, I understand now. Growing up in Hawaii, all my heroes told tales of Tahiti. The Hokulea left Honolulu Bay for Tahiti. And in those stories of sailing and surfing, there were whispering winds, crystal clear waters, green polys, and an ocean filled with unimaginable possibilities. I knew I'd make it here one day, but I always thought it would be chasing waves, not tales of coral gardens. My name is Sam Potter, and for the last few years, my curiosity has led me on adventures around the world. But more importantly than the adventures themselves are the people that they've led me to. And the ones I've truly fallen in love with are those who are still deeply connected to the natural world. This series is about them, their passion for wild places, and how we might be able to find our way back to the wild. Both being part of the Polynesian Triangle, there are some pretty plain to see commonalities between Hawaii and Tahiti. So upon my arrival, I almost expected to find a sense of home. But Mo'oreo was more closely related to fairy tales than reality. A real life Never Never Land, which is the perfect setting for the wide-eyed and wild group of island kids I'm here to meet. Oh. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we say in Taishan, Puai Mana Bernaka, who more often goes by tits, and his gang of lost boys and lost girls are a diverse collective of Mo'ore's finest. A young group of surfers, spear fishermen, school dropouts, and scientists who all fly under one fun loving, hard working, world saving banner. The Coral Gardeners. Tits often uses the term punk rock to describe Le Coral Gardeners. He says they work hard, play hard, party hard. And on this lovely Sunday morning, when Titwan's hangover kept him from picking us up at Mo'ore's port, I knew he was a man of his word. Party hard? Check. So, we wandered around the island for a bit. Until Tits eventually shook off the hangover. How do we feel about Tits 1? <laughs> Wild boy, huh? <laughs> and within seconds of our meeting, we were packed into the Blackbird, flying across a perfectly blue ocean in search of adventure. Okay, let's go, brothers. Play hard, check. We got here this morning. Tits 1 forgot to pick us up, but he's trying to make up for it. And <laughs> it's working. <laughs> so the plan is to try to get some fish for dinner, try to catch, catch some waves, maybe go dive with some whales. Yeah, let's we'll see what the day brings. When it comes to the ocean, it's better not to ask for anything and then just see what happens. And within 10 minutes of leaving the lagoon, we find ourselves amongst the perfect opportunity to catch some dinner. I love those kind of fishing uh, method because you're collaborating with the birds. Our boat is called the Black Bird. Why? It's a long story, my friend. Hey, whoa, 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 whoa! I like this fishing method, I like it. You, good choice on the lure. Sometimes the, the marlin, he come and steal our fish. Ooh la la! Let's go, Captain, let's go, let's go! Yay! Thanks, bird! Yay. Ooh. I think he's a tiger. And with that fish secured, your turn, Tits. Heard you getting a little excited. Whoa, whoa! Good day for fishing after the party of yesterday night. <laughs> I like the way Titoan spoke of fishing in his alliance with the birds. His connection to the ocean was vibrant and his love contagious. Good job, bro. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think we're done. We have enough, huh? Yeah. Nice. Heading back into the lagoon, Titoan made a quick observation and cut the engines. Have you ever uh, dove with whales before? I've never dove. Humpback whales? Yeah. Never dove with a humpback. That's so cool. So there are two of them right here. 
In this clarity of water, there's two whales. Yeah, yeah. The coral reef, they are really important for the whales, the humpback, because that's where they come to rest with the babies. Sometimes my dad, when I was a little kid, uh, at the end of school, he was coming with his, his small boat. I jump in the boat, and then after school, we go diving with the whales. The babies, they are really playful. So they come, come at you, and sometimes they, they can imitate what you do. Huh? They play, they play. Uh -huh. If you do your thing, maybe sometimes the calf, the baby, or the whale, they can come closer to you. That the only thing you don't want to do with the marine life is to run after them, yeah. you know, let them come. And yeah, that's yeah. when the beauty, when the whale comes straight like, like this, man, sometimes it's good. So to abide by the loving wisdom of Tituan, we geared up in case a whale came to say hello. And we just did our thing, which for us meant eating mangoes. And as if to confirm my lingering suspicion of Mo'orea being magic. <laughs> what are you talking about? What are you talking about? A whale just popped up right here. Like we're sitting there looking for whales that way. And one jumps on his hip. What? <laughs> what the heck? However, just as quickly as a whale can swim into your life, they can swim right the hell out of it. But that is the closest I've ever been to seeing a whale underwater. And now, I'm hooked. New goal now. We need to see a whale. A si a that whale is the whole water. mission, yes. That was sick, huh? That was insane. Eating the mango. We spent the rest of the day looking for whales. And at times, it felt as though they were literally surrounding us. Whale number two. know the direction that they were heading and find a suitable place to hop in where they could possibly pass us by. But no luck. Whaleless. Oh, it's hard to time being in the water with them. They just do this. And they're they're hundred, they're hundred yards that way. And as we were about to cut our losses and count our blessings, we saw two more whales off in the distance. And these ones we're doing something a little different than the rest. It looked like they were playing. So Titorn and I went for one last swim into the blue, in hopes we may cross paths with a couple of Mo'orea's gentle giants. I see it! My own two eyes! Coming our way, huh? She was so, she was so pretty! Did they go? That was so sick. And I dive and I look to my right and there's a whale just goo, like swimming with us. So it's me, Tituan, and this whale, like so close I can see his eye just looking at me. And we're all just like kind of swimming together. It was one of the craziest moments of my life, 110%. <laughs> <laughs> Dreams come true today. That was that was insane. That was insane. I was told that the island of Mo'orea is a giver. Oh, yeah, I love you. And I must say she gave us a hell of a welcoming party. As we cleaned our fish, the sun set and the moon rose. And it became easy to see how a place as powerful as this one could mold such an inspiring group of people. The fact that we just pulled the boat up to our house right now. <laughs> it's just... You guys coral gardens are right here, yeah? Yeah. What are we, so what are we doing tomorrow in the actual garden? So tomorrow, Monday, you can just come walking or swimming to the headquarters <laughs> and we'll uh, deep dive into the, the coral world, like the nursery, planting some corals, 
and you will meet all the team here. Hell yeah. Yeah, bro. Let's eat some sashimi. Come Monday morning at 8 a.m. sharp, a salty crew of coral gardeners filed into HQ. A massive upgrade from the not too distant past, when HQ was simply code for Tituan's bedroom. They discussed their recent trips to Geneva, Fiji, Tuamotu, and their plans of opening locally managed coral gardens around the world. They spoke of global coral adoptions, artificial intelligence development, community outreach programs, and of course, the gardening itself. What's working, what's not, what's next, and how to ensure the success of their one and only mission, to save the reef. There is a well with the mom and calf in the bay in front of the headquarters. So I told the team we should apply to the best office in the world contest, yeah. It's on. <laughs> it's on, baby. <laughs> Just five years ago, None of this existed. The Coral Gardeners was simply a dream of Tituan's, and now it's an incredibly successful nonprofit that has over 30 full time employees. My question is how? Tituan is a volcano of ideas. Eruption every time. He's a funny guy, yeah? Tituan, he has everyone on his shoulders at Coral Gardeners, he's the center of coral gardeners. How are you so like this, you know? Today you're not believing it. I will believe for the two of us. And tomorrow you can believe again and you can do it by yourself. I think that the fact he's a volcano, like overheating, it came from the fact that he planted his first coral. I can remember the first time I realized the decline in our coral reefs, but I didn't do anything about it. It just felt like such an overwhelming problem. Like, what am I supposed to do? And you had that same thought, but did something about it. You're like, what am I supposed to do? And then you worked towards a solution. Like, what was the moment of like, this, this is dead? I have to do something about it? And what did you do? Yeah. That's a great question. So we arrive at the surf break, we throw our anchor, we go at the, at the, at the lineup. We watch under our feet and all the reef, all the coral's head were white. So I see the coral reef were, were, were bleaching. I understood this means we're dying. And it was not only happening here on our tiny island of Moria in the middle of the South Pacific Ocean. In just 30 years, in the second, we lost almost half of the coral reef for white. And the second thing I realized that day is that the coral reef, they were the things giving me everything I needed in my life. For the fish, I eat every day since I'm a little kid. From the best moments, surfing some coral reef waves with my, with my buddies. I was 16 years old and I realized that the thing, which is the most important thing in my life, is dying in front of my own eyes and around me, nobody is doing anything. So I'm just hopping right outside the Coral Gardeners HQ with all these boys and girls. About 10 or 15 years ago, the rock structures beneath these waters were covered in corals and fish in color. But due to human pressures like climate change, agricultural runoff, and sunscreen use, these corals died, and the algae took over. Our mission down here was to remove all the algae. That way, the gardeners could plant corals that have developed a stronger resilience to these pressures. It felt like finally tending to a garden that's been left to the weeds for far too long. But in comparison, this is the easy part. The real work begins once they start planting the corals. A healthy garden takes time and attention. It takes love and observation. 
And an underwater garden is no different. Surprisingly kind of sad. I didn't expect to like get kind of bummed, but that was like the first time I was like, oh, everything's dead. I realized the problem and I wanted to do something. And then a couple of weeks later, I was introduced to what we call coral gardening. And I told myself, this is the coolest thing on earth. I just felt in love with having your little fa'apu. In Taishan, it means your little farm, garden, underwater. So you have, you have this nursery, you have hundreds of little corals growing, and then you're working underwater. No noise, no people talking, and the fish, they come ar around you. A new habitat for the fish, a new habitat for the crabs. I was hooked. I say, okay, I want to work with all those corals, all those fish, I want to work with the coral reef. And of course, after seeing Tetuan light up like that, I had to experience this coral gardening for myself. I planted my first coral when I was 16, so eight years ago. And, uh, and now in front of my house, there are more healthy corals, all the fish are back, and it used to be a really brown, dead, and damaged, you know? So now we have a full-time team of 25, 30 people. We have some scientists, engineers, and more and more experts, so we can do a, a, a better and better job every year. Yeah. Let's go. As complex as corals are, the process of gardening is rather simple. Step one, take a swim around the garden. Or, if you're a true coral gardener, you walk. This is the reef donor site a place they are able to monitor full-time, thanks to people from around the world adopting corals. What we're looking for is a big, healthy coral, a mother colony that has been able to adapt to not only our rapidly changing climate, but other human pressures as well. Step two, now that we've located one of these resilient corals, we carefully collect fragments of it, pinching off two dozen or so of its little branches always less than 10% of the colony. Step three, bringing our fragments back to the boat, we secure them within the woven threads of a piece of rope, giving each fragment adequate space to grow. Step four, we take our string of corals and add it to the nursery. Here, they'll be closely cared for, thanks to people around the world adopting corals. Weekly monitorings and algae cleanings will make sure these little guys grow healthy and strong. And about a year from now, it'll be time for the fifth and final step. Fragmenting our once tiny fragments and planting them onto damaged reefs using mineral marine cement. The coral gardeners have set out to save the world's reefs, but they made it clear to me that that's not something they can actually do. That's something only mother nature can do. What they can do, what we all can do, is simply lend a hand. Planting corals, I remember telling myself the effect it was having on me might be the solution to create a movement. Not saying things, doing their thing, having people be a part of it. This past five years, we proved that nothing was impossible, that if you work hard enough, if you love what you do, if you believe enough in, in, in what you want to achieve, you can do anything. But it was also the hardest years of my life. I did almost three burnouts, not able to talk for two, three days because I worked too hard. I, I stopped surfing, I stopped, I stopped going at my friend's dinner. I stopped everything for this project. When you love something, when you care about something damage, you gotta do everything for it. And sometimes you forget yourself. So yeah, I, I work really hard. <laughs> I learned so many things, man. And I realized I have still so much to learn. Now I know that the next couple years are going to be insane. We are going to fucking change the world.
we are going to revolutionize, create a movement of, of young fishermen, surfers everywhere around the planet. There are corals everywhere in the, in the most remote places you can think. And there are people who need the coral reef to live. And those people, I want to give them opportunities, meaning in life. And that's what we are going to do. It's on me. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. God damn. Okay, let's go party. Yep. Party hard, play hard, work hard. Check. The gardeners planted more coral just this year than they have in the last five. And with goals of planting one million corals by 2025, this is just the beginning. Here's where they are gardeners. To be a coral gardener is no longer just a dream. It's a career path for the working class of Mo'orea. And soon, the world. Les Coral Gardeners are going global, creating opportunities for people around the world to make a living by caring for the places they call home. Tituan Poimana Bernakar has turned his passion for coral and his love for Mo'orea into a mission to save the world's reefs and a movement that I believe has the ability to not only create a happier and healthier planet but a happier and healthier people. Hey guys, Maururu, thank you for watching the movie. If you want to support our Coral Gardeners missions, you can visit our website, coralgardeners.org, adopt some corals, buy some merch, and donate. It's on.